Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Dr. Shadow, the Internet Personality with Best Hair, and welcome to week four of. Which brings us. Jump! Ah! What the? Well, yeah, technically, but the coin switched hands a bunch of times after it was stolen from him, and it's pure coincidence that it just so happened to be in Fazio's hands when he told the Leprechaun that. Oh, whatever. Anyway, Leprechaun 4 in space. That's right, the fourth movie in this franchise decides to up the ante on locations even more and go where no leprechaun has gone before. Set in the mystical, futuristic 21st century, Leprechaun 4 in space is in space. And then it didn't even go so far as Jason X is to try and actually explain how the Leprechaun ended up in space. This is another sequel that's just completely disconnected from the rest of the series. Leprechaun 4 in space takes place in space because it takes place in space, and there happens to be a leprechaun in it. So what is this tale of terror and advanced technology? Space Marines track down a hostile alien leprechaun, but end up in a bind when their mission turns up a space princess, a planet the company is very interested in, and oh yeah, a frickin' leprechaun who picks them off one by one. Because the leprechaun has his own little quest in this galaxy. What for? Let's take a look at Leprechaun 4 in space and find out. Our story opens in space. Incredibly poor CGI asteroids fly by, but remember this is a straight-to-video movie from 1996. The newest video game console on the market was a Nintendo 64. These 3D models with bump mapping at a buttery smooth 24 frames per second weren't that bad. Well, the original Jurassic Park released in 1993, but just ignore that little detail. This particular pile of primitives contains our space marines for the tale. Lucky, played by Lad York. Mooch, played by Rick Peters. Sticks, played by Miguel A. Nunez Jr. Dolores, played by Debbie Dunning. Danny Martinez, played by Mike Canizo. Books, played by Brent Jasmer. And their sergeant, Metalhead, played by Tim Calceri. Seems they're heading to planet Ithacon on a search and destroy mission. We've been chasing this alien son of a bitch long enough. In the past six months, he has disrupted the galactic mining operation to a tune of a half a billion dollars! Uh, half a billion dollars. And exactly a lot of money these days. Come the year 2096, I fail to see how it would have even more spending power. Either way, the mission is simple enough. Until a sudden spare character arrives! Tina Reeves, played by Jessica Collins. She's a space biologist and has been given specific orders by their benefactor, Dr. Mittenhand, to tag along and collect any samples of alien life they may encounter. Thus, the sergeant calls up Mittenhand immediately, played by Guy Siner. With all due respect, sir, we can't be babysitting some little- You have your orders, sergeant. I suggest you follow them. And traveling to far-off planets in some godforsaken corner of the galaxy to fight hostile alien life forms is one thing, but absolutely nobody wants to deal with a fucking escort mission. So Metalhead points out who our protagonist is for this movie by giving sole responsibility for Dr. Reeves' safety to books over here. If that's not a big enough hint... Oh! Who's driving this, Rachel? Sorry. You all right? Feeling lightheaded. Sudden sweats. Can't breathe through all this over sexual tension. What is going on planet side? Well, the capture of our space princess, of course, Zarina, played by Baywatch babe Rebecca Carlton. She was kidnapped by the Leprechaun. Not that he intends to hold her in chains forever, no. The Leprechaun has other plans. I'm Love's own messenger, sent to bring you tidings of joy and the promise of newborn ecstasy. This is all just one big convoluted way to take her out on a date. It's probably not the best first impression, but I understand there is likely a shortage of Baywatch Babe space princesses on Leprechaun Mingle. Yeah, we're suddenly back to the Leprechaun trying to get married. Zarina thinks the idea is ridiculous, but the Leprechaun exposits his motivation. Zarina is a princess. When she marries, she becomes a queen. Who she marries becomes a king. And it's good to be the king. From now on, the rest of this miserable universe will bow and scrape before me. And if they don't, off with their heads! <laughs> so, kind of the same deal he has going on right now, but with paperwork to back it up. 
The fact that the Leprechaun is an ugly, evil asshole does put a damper on his attempts to woo the princess, but the Leprechaun has his own charm, the allure of riches. Which is why Princess Serena here was his target for the plan. You see, her father is a noble, wise king who gave all his royal wealth to the people, leading to happiness and prosperity in an age of peace and ah, oh, whatever. Serena's a princess who has to shop at Space Goodwill. It's absurd and she hates it. But hoarding riches is what the Leprechaun is all about. You'll have everything you ever wanted. Gold is power. Gold is power. Power. It's kind of like the guy at the bar who tried to pick up that lady by showing her his bank account. Except successful. And in space. But the Marines are in the caves attacking the alien hand puppet! This gets the attention of the Leprechaun, who sets up a little trap for Lucky. When the greedy guy grabs the gold, the Leprechaun lightsabers his legs, locks and loads! Thus, it's a Leprechaun versus Space Marine shootout! Until one of the bastards throws a grenade right where the princess goes! Get down! And the Leprechaun sacrifices himself to save her. You know, I've been giving him shit over the last couple of movies for all these marriage proposals and plans, but, you know, honestly, it looks like maybe he just really wants to get married because he's that devoted. The Leprechaun's sacrifice saves Princess Serena, but she is still knocked unconscious, and her hand gets torn off in the blast. Whoops. More importantly, Kolowski, played by Jeff Mead, adds insult to injury by peeing on the Leprechaun's corpse. <laughs> oh, shit! Oh, way to go, K.O. I'll give you a round of applause, but I see you already got the clap. But the Leprechaun's uh, soul, space, energy, magic uh, force. The Leprechaun's force spirit swims upstream straight into the man's crotch. That is not a sentence I expected myself to ever say in my life. So not only did they kill the Leprechaun, but they got his gold and a space princess to boot. Returning to their ship in orbit, we are introduced to another ship scientist, Harold, played by Gary Grossman. Tina tells him, hey, our medical emergency right here is a princess from planet Dominia. Therefore, if we help her, we might just be able to get some good space politics points to boot. Harold doesn't appreciate his underling telling him what to do, but Books gets him on board. I think. Uh, the next thing we see is Harold showing off the mystical futuristic technology allowing them to haul crap tons of gold from the space leprechaun's hoard. What do you do when you want to unload it? <laughs> nice! Now put it away and never bring it up again. Until sometime around at Act 3, I guess. More importantly, Dr. Mittenhand calls up like, hey, got a mining ship coming to drill this planet, but until they arrive, we're gonna have to stick around and guard the find. Problem is, their contracts are up at midnight, and the sergeant won't allow for this illegal extension. Mittenhand, though, says he has no choice. Is that clear? With all due respect, sir, thank you for understanding. No one cares about space laws or space loopholes. It's only about the space body count floating. With that in mind, we jump over to the celebration of a job well done. Kolowski and Dolores decide they should party away from prying eyes and slip away. Unfortunately for him, though, as he prepares to get down and dirty, he suffers a pain boner! The most excruciating of his life! That's because... Let that be a lesson to you, lad. Always wear a prophylactic. In the true fashion of any alien creature worth his salt, the Leprechaun gets on board by bursting out of a crew member. The Cockburster runs away, and Kolowski is dead. Not that anyone's going to hear about this for a while. Dolores is busy dealing with the Leprechaun Space Cowboy, Books is trying and failing to win the affection of Tina, and Harold is a bit preoccupied with creeping up on the Space Princess, as she is unconscious, and in need of observation. However, he also inadvertently observes that somehow she grew her hand back. Impossible. No, Harold. It is not impossible. Her tissues have regenerated. How long have you been watching me? You do not want to know. Dr. Mittenhand says that this particular space princess has magical healing DNA, making this an incredible find for science. Thus, they must keep it a secret. 
Shouldn't be hard to keep as Dolores came back to the group like there's a monster in his pants and they suit up and get to battle trying to track it down. The sergeant's like, hey, this place looks promising, but Tina says it's too dangerous. We can go anywhere we want, lady. We're Marines. It's filled with flesh-eating bacteria. Mooch, you're up. Well, that explains which one of them is going to be the next to go. Doubly so, after a little deliberation, it's decided that Mooch won't go alone. No, he's going to have backup in the form of the protagonist. Jeez, why not just give Mooch a red shirt while you're at it? They do have protective suits, but that really doesn't mean much when the Leprechaun also has a protective suit and a knife, tearing a hole in Mooch's only line of defense. Well, are you alright? It's Mooch. Jeez, that stuff works fast. Mooch looks like he's cosplaying a Doom Revenant. Failing to stop the Leprechaun, the sergeant decides they should all just say fuck it and leave. Besides, the Leprechaun says he just wants the princess back, as he's quite good at killing them. Maybe they should just give in to his demands? Midnight's like, no, can't lose the princess. We need her for, uh, well, that's, that's none of your business. Just kill the Leprechaun. The sergeant is like, pfft. No, so Mittenhand has no choice but to reveal himself for all to see. As a like the wizard of Oz, I always think running things from behind a curtain. Revealing that he is actually half man, half computer. Or more like 10% man, 15% computer, 75% wheelchair. Mittenhand points out that in case of emergency, he does have the power to extend their contract, and a leprechaun sure sounds like an emergency to him. Failure to comply will result in summary execution. But continuing the mission and exterminating the leprechaun will net them a sweet bonus. So they begrudgingly agree. One more thing! If I lose any more of my troops, your ass is grass! If, if you even got an ass! Of course, it's where he keeps the coaxial connection. So the mission is on, one leprechaun for untold riches. And who doesn't like riches? Especially the leprechaun, who just now at the 40 minute mark realizes, hey, that's right, if I get married, half my riches gut into the hands of my queen and it's kind of like someone stealing me gold. Not to worry, he has a plan to deal with that annoyance as well. I'll wet her, bet her, and bury her all in the same day. <laughs> just fill out all the answers the same and fuck, marry, kill. While the Leprechaun and the soldiers face off against one another, Harold is continuing experiments on Dr. Mittenhand's command, utilizing the blue blood of the Space Princess to grow a finger, proving it can be used for regeneration. Something they might need real soon as Books locates a Leprechaun in the engine room, at which point the Leprechaun magics up a pair of handcuffs, locking Books to a grate. The Leprechaun throws flames as Books fires back, escaping his binds. They then escape the Leprechaun. Leatherland. Roast her yet. This barbecue's only just begun. And one thing about the Leprechaun's dialogue this time around. It's not nearly as fun and over the top as it was in Leprechaun 3. Hell, the thing never even says a limerick in this movie. It's time for the call to action. So like the video, me son. Click there to subscribe and right by its side is the bell for notification. The sergeant and Dolores catch up with Books and Tina while the Leprechaun closes in on Sticks and Danny. So Danny just says, fuck it and leaves. Not taking into account that this means he's all alone when he's approached by the Leprechaun. Danny's nothing if not a coward though, saying, hey, screw the princess. Do what you want with a girl, just leave me alone. The Leprechaun's like, that's swell. Just come over here so we can shake on it. But he actually intends to shoot the Leprechaun, but the Leprechaun actually lured him to be pulverized by steel crates. Oh, smashing! Simply smashing boy! <laughs> a crushing defeat, to be sure. Well, his life might have come to an end, but Mittenhand believes with their newly calculated rejuvenation formula, his might begin once again. He regales Harold of tales of his past, and how he ended up in this lowly state. In his youth, he was beautiful, but then came the experiment to create the first computer with an organic structure. Something went wrong. No, Harold, it all went according to plan. Moron, look at me! They put him together, but they failed to use the correct amount of thermal paste. But with magic space princess regenerative DNA power, maybe, just maybe, he can walk again. With that, let's see how the prospective body count is doing. Dolores takes point right when the door slams shut, for the leprechaun is here. Take this, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Thank you. 
and the leprechaun explodes! For like the fourth time. And just like all the others, it doesn't fucking matter as he reconstitutes and hurls Dolores over the edge, sending her falling to her death. One of those artistic deaths where she has just enough life left to tell them what to do. Kill him. Yeah, that, that, that would solve your problems, I'd reckon. In the meantime, work on the lab continues unabated. But what's this? There's a ring on the ring doorbell. Let me in, please! They tore off all my clothes! Let me in before they come back! Dr. Reeves? Well, goddamn, they know how to keep this movie interesting enough for me to keep watching. They being the Leprechaun, of course! As when Harold opens the door, Nikki Tina is nowhere to be found. And he instead gets whacked in the cock! Not that this is the end of Harold, no. See, before Leppy can take out Mittenhand, the Mastermind uses his mental powers to try and talk things out with the Tiny Terror, but merely as a means to manifest Harold a moment of murder for him. But, oh yeah, they, they still haven't established how to kill a Leprechaun yet, so that doesn't work. But you know what does? <laughs> the good old-fashioned fling of the face flattener. Goddamn thing left Harold looking like a garbage pail kid. So it's Mittenhand's turn. Later, first gotta free the princess and make sure she's on board with this whole, uh, murder thing. <laughs> Don't worry, she's plenty evil and has no qualms whatsoever with whatever horrors the leprechaun has in store for her captors. You know that restorative formula Mittenhand made from the princess's blood? <laughs> Let's just toss in a spider, a scorpion, blend on high for three seconds, and inject it straight into Mittenhand! Right before the marines show up too late to save, uh, anyone, but just in time to get in a shootout where acid gets on Tina's armor! Well, better take it off! And get her top nice and wet. They really want to make sure I don't turn off this movie, don't they? To that end, when they move in to save the princess from the leprechaun, well, first thing he does is magic an absolute buttload of explosives all over the sergeant, and the princess does one better. This is your fate. You have no one to blame but yourselves. She just whips her titties out for all to see. But as it turns out, this has sinister undertones. On the planet Dominia, when a woman of royal blood shows you her breasts, it's a death sentence. It's got its ups and downs, but overall I think I'm gonna like the future. This allows Zarina and the Leprechaun to escape with the sergeant as a hostage, but they aren't giving up. Keeping on the Leprechaun's tail, they intend to rescue the sergeant. Only problem with that is, uh, well, when they finally see him again... He was standing on the corner of 31st and Main. I was feeling kind of flirty as Sarge. he turned and walked my way. He is completely under the Leprechaun's control, and he is fabulous! Honestly, I kind of love this look for him. It reminds me of Beef from Fan of the Paradise. They try to reason with him, but he's completely lost his mind at this point. And while Books refuses to hurt the sergeant, Tina recognizes they must or he will kill them. So she whips out badass self-defense karate moves, beating him into submission. But then he rises again to attack once more, fighting them and himself. Kill! Eyes on the bicycle! Kill! Ah! This is far too violent. Shut up, you pussy! So it's either the Leprechaun 4 is actually much more cerebral than people give it credit for, and this scene is a masterful work of writing and acting, showing the duality of duty versus freedom, right versus wrong, knowing your true self, what it means to even be human. Or alternatively, someone just thought it would be funny to put the sergeant in a dress. He keeps attacking, but whoopsie, never jam your bayonet into a power outlet. Oh, I'm not sure how the wooden stock of that weapon conducted electricity yet. Either way, looky here! The sergeant was a cyborg all along, with a completely robotic brain! See, question of human or... Oh, never mind. The leprechaun activates the ship's self-destruct sequence! Before getting his gold. Guess he just wanted to make the climax more exciting. As such, he puts a force field around the shuttle, preventing its use. The princess is like, hey, we need that, but he explains it to prevent the good guys from using it while they have their climax. You full busting bitch. What did you say? Rich. You'll be rich when we find we go. But of course, there's already a few cracks showing in their relationship. You know, in case you missed that scene earlier where he mused out loud about killing her first thing. 
The heroes are down to Books, Tina, and Styx, though. As such, Styx is tasked with turning off the ship's self-destruct while Books and Tina go do that climax thing. However, the lab is much stranger than they left it, full of giant webs. So before Styx can crack the code... Huh. What the fuck happened to you? He is attacked by Mitten Spider! Seriously, that, that is the name they used for this form. Books and Tina aren't doing much better finding the shuttle and the death bubble surrounding it. So they gotta find the leprechaun, who's currently using magic to cause his fiancée to faint over how hideously ugly she has become. And gets her out of the way, so when they show up, it's another leprechaun and space marine shootout. Book's armor is hit, so he has to tear it off and show his manly manliness. Tina, meanwhile, tries to shoot the leprechaun, forgets the ammo, and flees accidentally activating the embiggening laser, which just so happens to be pointing at the leprechaun, and wouldn't you know it, they now have a gigantocon to deal with. All right. Big is good. Uh, please don't use that to kill them all. That's going to be a nightmare to edit around. Books decides to solo the Gigantocon, while Tina heads back to help Styx. Somehow this really isn't all that exciting. Styx has no idea what the password is, and Books is just running and hiding from the giant leprechaun of varying resolution. Tina better do something to keep me watching. <laughs> oh, Mitten Spider just ripped her pants off. That works. So she spends the rest of the movie running around in her undies. Making it to the lab, she is attacked by Mitten Spider. But that's no problem, looky here. There just so happens to be a handy dandy giant vat of liquid nitrogen right next to the computer. How convenient. Spraying Mitten Spider down, they shatter the monster into little bits. Books, in the meantime, trips across the princess and decides, eh, save the evil bitch. They're slipping out the side while opening the outer doors to the cargo bay, blasting the leprechaun into space where he explodes. Again. But, oh yeah, the self-destruct is still going. Gotta figure out Mittenhand's password. Three, two, one, detonate. Detonation has been cancelled. They have no idea how lucky they are that this movie happened to be made before all passwords had to be at least eight characters with upper and lower case letters and numbers and special characters. Therefore, happy ending! They didn't explode, but the leprechaun did. And is obviously still alive. And the princess is God knows where doing God knows what. My guess is she's hopping in their one and only shuttle just to say fuck it and leave. Anyway, that was Leprechaun 4 in space. Fuck me. Okay, now I feel bad for only giving Leprechaun 3 a 2. Leprechaun 4 is a pretty drastic step down, and it's not entirely for reasons you would expect. While Leprechaun 3's story was jokes first, plot second, Leprechaun 4 is plot first, Leprechaun second. The idea of putting the Leprechaun in space is inherently silly, but it almost comes off like an afterthought here, as the Leprechaun doesn't get to do all that many gags, never once says a limerick all movie, and none of the other characters even once refer to him as a Leprechaun. He's just an alien to them. That makes the whole thing come off as a kind of low-budget sci-fi horror comedy that just so happens to have a Leprechaun in it, but it doesn't even like to acknowledge that. I will admit I did enjoy quite a few parts of this, mostly Dr. Mittenhand's banter with Harold and the scantily clad women. But that was enjoyment nonetheless. I hardly got any memorable scenes of the Leprechaun, though. It opened pretty strongly in that regard, too, with the kidnapping and proposal, but once the Leprechaun is the alien scurrying around the ship, it doesn't get all that much screen time, and when he does, he really doesn't seem himself. At the end of the day, Leprechaun 4 in space is not regarded very high in the series, and it's easy to see why. In a horror comedy series about a killer leprechaun where he travels to LA or Vegas or the hood, the being in space part honestly wasn't the deal breaker. It's the fact that the movie is space horror comedy may contain traces of leprechaun that is. Coming in at two, lightsabers to the butt out of five. And that is the problem with the five point rating system. Big difference in quality, small difference in rating. Thank you all for watching. I have been Decker Shadow. And remember, the vacuum of space sucks. I'll kill him! How dare you! He's my father. I'll kill him. Oh, horror movie sequel, The Monster Goes to Space. Uh, Jason X, that was easy. Or Hellraiser Bloodlines. Or the random algorithmically selected video. It's the future. Robots decide everything. <laughs>